Well, folks, I'm here today with uh, Taylor Booty, who is a PhD student in the Department of German and Slavic at University of Colorado Boulder. Yes, sir. My erstwhile Department of Employment. <laughs> and uh, Taylor's got all kinds of cool things he can say about the Bolsung slash Nibelung tradition in different uh, time periods and places. Uh, Hopefully. Maybe some good remarks on grad school for people who might want it. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Maybe some inside scoop on what it's like to be my willing and loyal servant. <laughs> yeah, right. The indentured TA ship. Yes. Because uh, you were an excellent TA that way. And uh, and who knows, whatever else. We've got about an hour here. So uh, taking your questions. But first, let's have Taylor uh, sum up the uh, nibbling and lead in 20 seconds. Oh, God. OK. Um, <laughs> All right, where we start? Okay, our hero Siegfried leaves his home kingdom of uh, Zen, I believe, to visit the Burgundians. He said this beautiful woman there that he wishes to marry. Uh, many, many pages later, there's an arrival where the uh, king, uh, Gunnar or Gunther, I, can't, I get these confused constantly between the two. Anyway, the king wonders who this fantastic young man is and his servant Hagen tells them the story of like, oh, this Siegfried, he like killed a dragon and did a bunch of other cool stuff. That's all not gonna be in this book though. Right. Uh, and then it starts, he kidnaps, well, he travels with the king to Iceland so the king can woo the queen uh, Brunhild um, and there's some trickery involved, they return uh, more trickery now sort of is involved where in uh, Brunhild convinces Hagen to kill Siegfried, which he then does. Um, Siegfried's wife, Kriemhild, then wants revenge, goes and marries Attila the Hun, and everything burns down. That was more than 20 seconds. It was more than 20 seconds, but that's about as short as I can get it. But it's a, it's a, uh, it's so alike and so different from the saga of the Bolsons. Yeah. Right. I mean, just that last part that you mentioned, she marries Attila mm -hmm. to get revenge on Hagen and, and Gunther. But in the the Norse tradition where it's Gunnar and Hogni, right? So Kat, I, like I can't see the screen as well, but yeah. Kat says Hagen is that his name. So that is, yeah, in German, but then yeah. in, in Norse, it's Hogni. Yeah. And then and his character is totally different. Completely like, different. Yeah, because yeah. in, in German, he's not the brother of Gunnar. He's... Uh, he's this this like elvish or half elvish advisor or something. He, yeah, he's like maybe like head knight advisor, mm -hmm. sort of like concierge almost. Um, maybe is the I, I'm sure there's a specific middle German term that I don't remember <laughs> from it, but something connect. Um, yeah, he's he's a knight in service to um, King Gunther, and the main reason so why Siegfried needs to die essentially is in part of wooing Brunhild for Gunther. Well, there's there's trickery there where Siegfried has to assist him during these trials, otherwise right. she's gonna kill them all. Uh, and then when they get back and Gunther and Brunhild get married on their wedding night, she thinks something is up and won't sleep with him and hog ties him and hangs him above the bed. All right. uh, he tells Siegfried this, whose response is, well, I'll help you out, brother. And Gunther's one stipulation is just don't sleep with her. So Siegfried goes, wrestles with Brunhild, and takes her girdle and ring and leaves. And that's all that sort of spoke. And she loses all of her magical strength after that. Uh, so it's at that point heavily implied that Siegfried has, in fact, slept right. with or had sex with Brunhild. Well, it's, it's kind of like it's kind of a Samson Delilah thing yeah. where, yeah. Sexual contact deprives someone of their power. Yeah, right. Um, the and then I mean the big thing. So the king finds out, and they're sort of trying to reconcile because they're both actually of equal rank. There's some stuff that plays in earlier with that. But um, Hagen, I mean, the, the big thing with the Nibelungen lead as opposed to the Volsunga saga is it's a knightly story right. and a courtly story. Right. So what Siegfried has done in taking Brunhild's girdle is essentially now 
Gunther's line of succession is completely in question. Right, right, right. That's, which is a big no-no. We have now sort of tainted any actual like parental lineage and our doubts can be cast. So Hagen, um, Dissant, like the way he kills Siegfried too is with a thrown javelin. Kills him like an animal, hmm. throws his treasure into the Rhine, which becomes the Rhine Guild. Um, so, I mean, that's like the big sort of death moment. It's played out extremely differently. Well, yeah, I mean, because in, in Volsungs and in the poems about the Volsungs and the Poetiketa, um, you you can encounter traces at least of three different ways Sigurd dies. Yeah. Uh, one of them is that he's killed out in the forest. And it's interesting you mentioned that Hagen in the Nibelungen League kills him like an animal because he is constantly analogized to a stag in the Volsung material. Right. Is that same motif there in the German material? It's it's less so. That that I think is stemming from more of like the knightly tradition. And it, it's, a, it's a very dishonorable way for him to be. And, and the Nibelungen League, Siegfried is a, like, yes, Sigurd is a superhero, but Siegfried is like, goes and conquers the land of the Nibelungen by himself. Right, right, right and comes back with like an army. Like there are parts where it's told like, and then it's it's sort of, um, is it Samson? Samson with the donkey jawbone, uh -huh. right? That he just like killed 1200 men on his, like Siegfried's doing that like in his sleep. It's the second Samson reference in this, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, no, like like su supremely mythic, yeah. um, like superheroes essentially. Right, right. It's. You know, I, I, I mentioned that I can't really remember there being that, that deer motif in the Nibelung, like in the Volsung tradition. And I think part of what causes that is when I read the Nibelungen lead in English or Middle-High German. <laughs> let me just say, all, I, I, I keep getting tripped up like every half page because I start hearing sharp-dressed man real loud in my head. and it keeps Oh my God, the, yeah, the... That's another thing from, if you read stylistically, they can feel very different because it's very important in the Nibelungen lead that they are extremely well-dressed yeah. and the colors <laughs> all the are just, all the time. Like you have extensive details on who's wearing what. Um, it's like a red carpet gala. Of dun, dun, dun. Who dun, are you dun, wearing dun, dun. sort of situation, yeah. um, which is- And it's mostly the men. Yes, because they are um, also, I suppose, depending on there's a couple, there's a really interesting argument that's actually Brunhild and Kriemhild that are the protagonist, like the actual protagonists of the story. I can see. Um, but yeah, the men being, again, like these knightly or kingly figures have to be dressed in like blue as this royal color too. Right. So you see that a lot. It's like, especially with Siegfried, um, just sort of decked out in full, full class of clothing. <laughs> Lots of descriptions of the horse, like how rich yeah, they are yeah. getting there. Um, it's important. And Volsungs has a little bit of that. Um, the saga has a little bit of that right after um, his first meeting with Brynhild before his second meeting with Brynhild. <laughs> There's a bunch of stuff that's actually from the German inspired Fitherick saga that actually does go into this right. long several paragraphs about how nice his clothes look. We got a question here from Guillermo. Uh, which translations of the Nibelung lead we all recommend? There are several on my Amazon wish list. I mostly go by reviews. Um, I mean, I've, I, it's been a while since I've read the English translation. <laughs> <laughs> but I struggled, not reading it most of the time in Middle High German, but reading it in contemporary German. Oh. Uh, I think the Hato, is that his name? That's the real old classic one, yeah. That, that one is what we were assigned a university that was um, seemed to suffice to, um, I'm actually unaware if there's something like online of like your translation. There is. Mode, is it? Okay. I cannot remember, unfortunately off the top of my head and I ought to have just had it out here, but uh, there is a new one actually from Hackett like last year. Okay. That's fairly similar to like my style where it's, you know, more contemporary, more plain English translation. Right. So if you're speaking to other, let's say, English speakers, I would say the Hato translation is the most prevalent one. Um, but then I would recommend checking out maybe the Hackett one, too, if you go to Hackett Publishing and see their translation. Yeah, I wish I could remember the name off the top of my head, but I'm not going to spend 10 minutes looking for the book. I ought to have thought of that beforehand instead of 
you know, being in a competition for the last <laughs> 10 hours. <laughs> but, okay. You know, cool. it's actually a joke for most of us when we say, like, the phrase pistols at dawn. But I was to literally. everyone else yeah. is a fucking joke. And then the end you are, it's just like this. But it's like, no, I have pistols at dawn. It's just like, I'll go get my gun. It's like, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. I have pistols at dawn, but I'll try to be there for it. Yeah, that's, that was right. That was my day. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, it gets real Kansas real fast going east. Oh, right. <laughs> it's just like, I mean, up. I just haven't spent that much time in like real east, east Colorado. And I was kind of picturing more like Wyoming or northern Colorado, but it turns into Kansas. Yeah, like it's we, funny how little time I've spent out there. <laughs> I think we we would see some of it. We were coming down from Minnesota or oh, from sure. where we are. It's one seventy six. So yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. Like straight from Nebraska. So it's like it's just very slow build until like you're past. You're in the Colorado, but it still feels like Nebraska. So right. And then at one point you go over a hill, and there's the rock. Yeah. I'm like oh shit, yeah. we're out. We're out of the. We're out of it now. Right. And that's where we all just stay. <laughs> um, um. So let's see. There was another thing I was going to ask you about, which was your opinions on Django and Chain. Right. And folks, feel free to interject your own questions, remarks. Um, Kat does ask about a nibbling based movie from 2004. Do you know what that might be? Um, I'm trying to. I don't. Hmm. Stella asks if it was The Dark Kingdom, The Dragon King. Could be. Um, I. They, I might have seen it, but I was probably not um, sober enough to remember it. If I have been, important admission. The um, that, that I, if I recall, I vaguely recall the movie, and I don't remember it being um, particularly high quality. Let's say, but in terms of, um, is it like riff tracks bad? Because we've got to talk about Berserker. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> we'll get to Berserker. Um, no, uh, so Django is. Like you described it um, as a sort of a stealth remake, which it, in a lot of ways, is. So there's a woman named Brynn. I mean, that's well, I mean, there's there's a lot that we can get into. I guess to lay the groundwork, a lot of it. When I was writing about it, Ray Wakefield and Karen Grimstad, who are from my um, University of Minnesota, I think they're both retired now, but they co-published an article on the women in both Full Sunga Saga and Lead Woman Lead, I had this very interesting thing that they talked about called the horizon of expectations hmm. with these stories. So what they're saying is essentially is like, they're getting to the question of like, well, which one's older, you know, or which one's more canon or like, which one do we take more seriously? And they sort of bypass that by talking about this notion of, well, there are specific elements that really should be present, let's say, in this story or this sort of narrative, you know, folktale continuation. Um, you have a dragon slayer and a betrayal, like the big ones, right? Like there's some sort of weird love triangle or situation involving a dragon slayer that then continues on. So that's not entirely present in Django Unchained, but as a movie, it actually functions like there's a lot in it that's coming from, let's say, this tradition of storytelling. Okay. So we have Volsung, the Belungen leads. The next big one people might be familiar with is Wagner, right. his opera, which then Fritz Lang. And what's opera dog is still a. Yeah, <laughs> we can get into what's opera dog to <laughs> kill the wabbit. Um, but so Django and Chain is really interesting, or it was when I first saw it because it. It just, it, it's very explicitly that story. So there's, right. there's a part in the movie, if you haven't seen it, where they're in the mountains of Wyoming, where you have- Filmed in Jackson Hole. Yep. Um, where Django, this freed slave, is working with a German bounty hunter named Schultz King. Uh, and they are, Django is explaining that his wife, who he was separated from, his name is Brunhilde. She speaks German. From Helda von Schaft, which is a weird Shaft reference, I later found out. Oh, okay. Um, but it, it, at some point, Django asks, "Well, how do you to King? How did you know my wife was German?" I said, "Well, her name was Brunhilde, and she's from the most famous of all German stories." 
and he sort of gives it's this super cool like re oral telling of it by a campfire, right? Where he's explaining that Helda is a princess. Does he do a better job than you of summarizing? Yeah, things. probably. Um, <laughs> well, he's Christoph Waltz. It's just gonna be better. It's just about everything. Um, but he so he's he it's great because he tells Shanko she's a princess because this freed slave in America probably isn't gonna know what a Valkyrie is, right, or something to that extent. Um, whose father is angry with her for some reason, and he traps her in a ring of fire, guarded by a dragon. And the hero Siegfried has to go climb the mountain to rescue her. Like, that's the basis of this story. And it's very explicitly told, but then you have a lot of things in it that are, um, they're actually, it's, it's, it's closer to Volsung Saga. I'll say that in a lot so of ways. So is Wagner. So is Wagner, because I think uh, Quentin Tarantino, the director of the movie, is sort of pulling from Wagner and Fritz Lang mm -hmm. as a filmmaker, like as part of like this tradition of doing, it's like, well, I'm, I'm gonna do a spaghetti Western, sweet, and then I have like this framework of this story and basic elements. So if we look at Schultz King, let's say as a character, uh, he's incredibly, let's say wise as a character, okay. intelligent, um, a trickster who is constantly putting on disguises. Um, is like this leading up to him having one eye? Or no, he just never has one eye. It'd be so <laughs> great if he did. But he has this. He's a bounty hunter, like a little it's called a literal chooser of the slain, right? Oh, okay. Huh. Who is you could go into king even as looking as like if you want to compare like Votan or Odin as like the king of the pantheon. Okay. It's a very Wagner esque interpretation of it. Um, but he, and he trains Django, right? Cause he's responsible for like this empowering of a warrior who he helps go and then rescue his wife. That is, so I find him to be like a very odinic figure, let's say in a, <laughs> in a variety of ways being, it's, um, Django is this like on, like unstoppable the nickname he gets is the fastest gun in the south where he's just this natural with guns all of a sudden as he's killing proto ku klux klan members yeah. and um everything else to go then rescue his wife broomhild i think is what how you describe broomhilda hildy uh so they arrive to the plantation where she's at and she's locked in the ground in a metal box they call the hot box so a so, ring yeah. of fire sure. you have Calvin Candy, who's this, who I think is supposed to be the dragon, then you have, um, or you can, it's not a literal retelling as much as like, no. it's very elusive to these things. Well, and that makes it more interesting than just, yeah, like, oh, we're absolutely. just gonna take the story and just pattern it on a different time. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I think the 13th Warrior is the best Beowulf movie, because it doesn't call itself Beowulf. And it's called, it doesn't call itself Beowulf when you're in like the caves fighting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it becomes strangely like early 20th century mole men horror sort of. <laughs> it's it's got its moments. It's that's that's great. Um, I really, but I like the idea of this. It's funny to me too because the idea of a spaghetti western works very well. I think as a saga adjacent genre, mm -hmm. let's say they're very frontier, um, morally gray. In a certain sense, um, I don't, the saga is less, I think, to a contemporary audience. They seem very, like, Egil being the hero of Egil's saga is, is well, pretty clear. But when I'm TAing for that class, doing it, sometimes it's hard to convince students that this gigantic asshole is a hero. <laughs> well, I generally tell people, I mean, it's a story for entertainment. Right. Right. I mean, well, Speaking of Tarantino, I mean, it's not like Pulp Fiction. I mean, who do you like in Pulp Fiction? But it's a story about these people. Right, right. right. I mean, it's, you have this, but this, um, like, expanding, king, like, kingdoms, too, with this, with the Spaghetti Western, it's like they're in Colorado and Wyoming and then right. they're down in Louisiana all of a sudden, where it's very different. Um, Django, at one point, is dressed, this is from a painting, but there's this great part where he gets new clothes, and it's just like this super, like, right. bright blue outfit of him, and he's on a horse, too, where I'm like, oh, it's just Siegfried riding off. No, no, that actually works team. really well, because, yeah, a sharp-dressed man riding on his horse into this settlement. Yeah, yeah. Um, who, again, is like that. this natural warrior talent with 
I mean, he's captured at one point and threatened with castration. I don't know if that's like the spot where the linden leaf fell. It's like he's supposed to be maybe stretching it. I don't know. Um, but it doesn't, in a way, matter because it is taking him as like the ultimate victor too. Um, like he kills a dragon and gets Blumilda. I think it's great. I and I never I watched Django Chain before I ever talked to you about this, and I never noticed any of this. Game. I mean, obviously I heard him retell the Volsungs thing. Oh, no, that's right, like yeah, but but I never it didn't even occur to me that it was sort of retelling the story. But you get yeah, you can certainly read it that way. I was too dumb to, but now I totally buy it. <laughs> uh, Simon asks, how do you think the Volsung Dragon setting side of the story became attached to the downfall of the Burgundians? Um, I don't know that. I think it has less to do with Fall of the Burgundians than Siegfried is the dragon slayer for. So you have Sigurd and Siegfried are both the, like, they are the dragon slayers. And so it's centered around them and the sort of the tragedy of them being betrayed and going from there. Um, the dragon slaying is significantly less important in the Nibu Lungan lead to some extent because they don't really tell it. Right, it's a flashback. Like, this, I heard that he did this thing. Right, Hagen's just like, I heard he killed a dragon and some giants and has a bunch of cool magical shit now um maybe we don't let him in he seems kind of dangerous it's like oh whatever <laughs> <laughs> um but that is i think that's a pretty central element to i think having something that is recognizably part of like this dragon slayer narrative let's say is you need you need that heroic dragon slayer who gains power from it so Sigurd. Um, learns, he talks to animals, right? He burns his thumb on the heart right. and ends up eating it. Where with Siegfried, he bathes in the dragon's blood right. and becomes, instead of drinking it, instead of drinking it, and becomes invulnerable except for one spot uh, where a linden leaf it has to be a linden tree. Right, Achilles <laughs> fell. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, which is then how. Hagen knows where to hit later because he tricks his wife into putting a cross right. where <laughs> put a put a target. <laughs> yeah, because you like a literal, I mean like it'll protect him, I swear. We're just gonna go out in the woods. Um right. be fine. So I know what part to protect. <laughs> yeah, and then the way she finds out is because um it's the it's the uh <laughs> it's the whatever the exhaust or whatever it is on the Death Star. The yeah, the exhaust part. Yeah, just like, <laughs> and again. Um, but the way Hagen comes back, they find Siegfried. They don't really know what killed him, but the wound bleeds in the presence of Hagen, which is how he's found out. Right. Like, which is such a medieval motif in its own. Right, and Hagen's just like, whatever, dude. Dude had to go. Right, <laughs> but I think this also connects with um, a broader question, which is how much of the story originally all went together, because the earliest. I think, maybe you can correct me on this, but I think the earliest written testimony to any part of this myth is in Beowulf. And yeah. there you've got Sigmund, Sigurd's father, yeah. right? And his nephew, he's not called nephew son, but just nephew in Beowulf. <laughs> yeah. uh, Fitzala, which is Sinfjotli, it's the second element in the Norse name, uh, who killed the dragon. And uh, there's no connection to anything else, just no mention of Valkyrie or any sort of, you know, thing with the Burgundians, Gunnar, Gunter. Right? Yeah. So that may, it may be that originally that's a separate chunk that later gets connected to this chunk about the Burgundians. Right. right. As, I mean, the Burgundians are also, a lot of these kingdoms, like Nibelungenland is not a real place, Bur like Burgundy is, the Burgundians right. are real, but as part of, I mean, temporally these stories are weird too, because oh, you yeah. end up with like, um, Atli and Volsung Saga and Eitzel oh. and Nibelungenli. So you have like the Huns are here, even though one, I think in the beginning of Volsung Saga, isn't it um, Volsung's dad, someone is king of the Huns yeah, right. at one point? You could actually assume Sigurd is a Hun based on his, yeah, it's all, it's all in this. So it's like, it's taking like important kingdoms that are parts in these early medieval German um, narratives, let's say, and yeah, it's feasible to think at some point appended to this, be, like, was the Dragon Slayer story, which became this, sometimes referred to as, like, the German Iliad, is this huge, because it's a big, it's significantly longer than um, Saga of the Full Songs, even though it covers, in a lot of ways, less, a lot, yeah. a lot fewer generations. Right, right, it covers, um, like, chapter 20-something to the end. 
Well, not even to the end because it doesn't get into Hambir and Sorli. Um, but, you know, I think overall what you've got is you've got several discrete chunks that originally don't go together. Yeah. Right. I think you've got a Dragon Slayer myth. I think then you have the hero falls in love with the Valkyrie and is a love triangle myth. And then you have the, uh, the slaying of that hero, which may or may not be originally connected to that. And then you have the whole separate thing about Hamdir and Sorli in, in Scandinavia that I don't yeah. think ever actually makes it into the Nibelung tradition. No, not as far as I... I am aware. It's but that goes back to Jordanes, who talks about yep. Amias and Sarus. So I mean, there's all kinds of different ch chunks, and, and there could even be some historical basis mm -hmm. to the Burgundians, like because I know there's Gundaharius, yeah, right, who is some early king in that area who's killed by Hans. And there's a lot. I mean, there's some people. I don't necessarily buy this, but for a long time, people were trying to connect Arminius with I, Siegfried. I like, think that is when you started working blues. But I'm gonna I'm gonna stay I'm gonna say PG and I'm just gonna call that horse Nuts. spit. <laughs> That's right. I've never I've never bought the Arminius thing. Um, but there's I mean trying it's historically these things are super strange too because you're dealing with like fictional kingdoms or seemingly fictional kingdoms with real kingdoms and yeah. huge temporal swaths that are and what are huns mixed to, what are huns <laughs> yeah who is you know who's little daddy in this in this yeah, version. Right. Who are they king of for those <laughs> for those who don't get the reference attila is little daddy in gothic <laughs> we don't know his hunnish name we only know what the goths in his service called him um we, had, we do have a question here from john daly uh going up uh, general comparison i saw from your cv cu profile you studied weird fiction occultism fairy tales etc oops uh do you think many of these older stories still have life left in them for a 21st century audience anything you can think of that would make a good movie reboot Oh, um, I mean, I th it's it's cliche to sort of call these things timeless, but I think, I mean, in the case of um, Volsung and Nibelung Lied, I think it has a very successful one in Django. Like, I think explicitly and implicitly, that's a really cool adaptation of that narrative yeah. story. It's um, all the better for not putting that label on itself. Yeah, like, you don't don't call it that um fritz long movie I, it's great it's like four hours long and then two part or two movies technically um that it's early intolerable. expressionist german silent film uh i guess from the other things i guess more of my background is i did my masters on monsters and fairy tales in german germany and scandinavia i talked about um uh, the Blonde Eckbert by Ludwig Tieck, Little Mermaid by Anderson, and uh, Hansel and Ghetto by Brothers Grimm, Ideas of Monstrosity and Fairy Tales, where I sort of talked about the genre of fairy tales as being a bit like a monster, hmm. the way that it sort of gets constantly adapting, coming from like a folklore tradition, and you have the romantics, who sort of like make a very high literary version of it as opposed to then someone like the Grimm's who sort of have a very mixed idea right, right. of fairy tales hmm. where they are presenting in a lot of ways these as pure untouched folk tales that we now know aren't. They have the of, aesthetics of pure untouched folk tales. Yeah, and there's a lot of editing too. Like their process is so heavily, I mean, there's seven editions of these stories that they're yeah. constantly adding and cutting things from. And like, it's a very hybrid thing that um sort of goes with it and then yeah currently i'm studying weird german fiction like what give us an example of what you're what you're looking at right now um so i'm reading a lot of short stories by gustav meyrink who's an austrian um a german-speaking writer uh who's often sort of lumped in with hans heinz Eves, um as let's say a German speaking equivalent to the Anglo tradition, like Lovecraftian horror. Hmm. So weird fiction is what I'm looking at started in the sense of like Lovecraft cosmic horror. He has an essay talking about it and he mentions German authors. So I went to look at them and said, well, is there weird fiction? Sort of what we call it today in the German tradition. And there is, it's very different. So Mayrank is great. Um, sort of Any people. titles you recommend? People might want, might want to check that out. That's kind of intriguing. There's a short story collection by Mayrink called The Opal and Other Stories that I think is serviceable and very interesting. Um, Kafka is weird. It's not weird in the sense of like right, right. 
that um, in September, there's going to be a book, a uh, translation of a book called Mountain Seas and Giants or Mountain Oceans and Giants. I'm not sure the exact translation. It's Berge, Meer and Giganten by Alfred Dubin. That is crazy. It is, um, it is extremely weird. It go, it's like six different novels in some ways. Hmm. It's like a fictional post-World War II history hmm. where the big uh, climax involves the cracking open and harvesting of Iceland's volcanic energy that is then used to melt Greenland's ice cap that makes, that then inadvertently gives birth to a bunch of monsters. That have so to be defended against. This is in the back, like quarter of the book. There's like, it's extremely weird. It's uh, kind of Godzilla after a while. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, the solution <laughs> then is is crazy <laughs> too. I, you can there there what there used to the guy who's translating and the books coming out had a free English translation. I don't know if that's still available. Um, I recommend buying it, um, even if you do find it. It's. It's if you like Lovecraft but want 500 pages of just weird stuff that's that sort of hits the same. Do you like button. Lovecraft for your weird fiction interests? Start yes. Yeah, so as a starting, that's where it's sort of that was the starting point in a lot of ways was that essay of supernatural in horror, supernatural in fiction, hmm. where he traces um, this cosmic horror genre. Let's say, funnily enough, beginning. Um, or one of the first things he identifies is the myth of Ymir oh, huh. and the creation of uh, the world in Norse mythology. He like he gives an example of very early idea of cosmic horror. Interesting. I mean, I can see it. Uh, I don't believe I've read that by him. I mean, I've read some Lovecraft. I've read um, actually a lot of his poetry, which is <laughs> often not bad. No. Um, um, and then when I was a kid, it's probably before your time, when I was a kid, there was one of those text-based uh, RPG type Yeah, games. adventure games, yeah. Yeah, that was based on Lovecraft. It was called, I can't remember now. I think there may be even a DOS. Um, it's like a Mountains of Madness, like an adaptation of Mountains of Madness. No, no, it was something, or... it was, for, it, I don't know. I, I can't <laughs> think of the name, but it was, it, it's just something I always remember. It was, it was atmospheric. It's not Call of Cthulhu because it wasn't an RPG. It was a, or it wasn't like a D&D &D type RPG. It was like yeah. a computer thing. Like it was a DOS computer thing. Yeah, it was, that was the thing where it's like type go left or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Get in the car. Don't get in the car. <laughs>
Star Wars, George Lucas famously was reading that, sort of going through and structuring it in that way. See, see that whole memory annoys me because I remember in <laughs> high school, this was just an excuse for the English teacher to say, now we're going to watch the Star Wars trilogy because I just told you five, I just gave you like yeah. five minutes about Joseph Campbell. And his, his, right, yeah. Like, well, now sure you're going to watch the Star Wars trilogy. And that's uh, just, yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at it. And then, I mean, if you think about something like Django, then where really, where does he start in it? He's already left home. It's sort right. of like it's postmodern-y in the way that it's like flashbacks with when he gets there. Um, if he ends up in the, like, is he fa like, does Odin find him in the underworld when he's being led in this slave chain gang around and then is like raised up after with magic powers of being able to kill racists with a rifle really good? <laughs> I don't know. And in your own hero's journey, would your underworld experience be being my TA? <laughs> Seems um, likely. It would be if, if yeah, maybe if you were uh, a, a worse person to TA for, it could be. Uh, it wasn't actually that bad. Good. Um, no, you were you were a lot of fun to TA for. So you you mentioned a bunch of titles. Is there a way you could give me some of these titles afterward, and I can make a Patreon post with? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'd be happy to. So we'll we'll do that. We're, it's, it's hard to, to get over to the computer right now. Um, let's see, Nira asks if you've checked out the uh, Lovecraft Science blog. Oh, I have not, no. So I w wouldn't be able to speak with, uh, the point, so to go back to, if, if maybe we go back to Lovecraft a bit, I'm intentionally in a way trying to, when we talk about, so in general, when we talk about weird literature as a genre or weird fiction, Lovecraft is like the center in a lot of ways. It oh. becomes almost impossible not to like find recourse with this essay or his own work and the people. And but like in retrospect, he like the genre has been defined around him. Right, like talking to fantasy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which is fine, but the process, the part of where I'm at in my PhD research and what's going on right now means I have to develop like my own thoughts and ideas on it. So I'm intentionally trying to stay away from a lot of that makes sense. like classic definitions of it, as opposed to thinking about other ways to think about the weird. Sure. Well, that way, yeah, you're not, you're not filling your head with what everybody else says about it. Yeah. No, I, know what you, I, I, know, yeah. I know what you're saying. Yeah. So it's, I mean, I love love. Like I, I do enjoy Lovecraft. Like I love Jensei at least like met like these other people surrounding him um, as you know, when I was a teenager reading this stuff for the first time. So I think it's interesting to me that he referenced German authors in that mm -hmm. essay, like Hoffmann, Mehring, Eves, um, and go like, okay, let's read these guys then and see, are they doing something similar? Is this a German version of the weird in a lot of ways, like this early 20th century horror fiction? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, so I, I sort of avoiding a lot of things Lovecraft no, I, I related. I understand what you're saying there. Shadow of the Comet might have been that DOS game. <laughs> Finally uh, found it. Say, uh, my eyes are going bad. Sayuki asks, have you noticed the monsters changing and morphing according to technology also changing or changes to the group consciousness in some way? Yeah, I mean, monsters do classically change. Um, that's There's a very famous book called Monster Theory um, whose introduction was written by um, Professor Cohen, I think he's in Arizona right now, and he break he calls like Monster Theory Seven Theses that was like my Bible when I was writing my master's. Um, one of the things is that the monster always comes back in mm -hmm. new ways. So we think about a vampire classically, right? Like there's something very different between Bram Stoker's idea of a vampire and Anne Rice's. Yeah. Idea of vampire or huge twilight gulp. vampires. Right, right, huge gulp. Well, and then between Stoker and the Eastern European folkloric vampire. Right, it coming. If, I mean, we can think um, when you, I mean, trolls. Right, whatever I, the hell that means. Whatever they are. Right. Um, like they've been thought of and capitulated, not capitulated, but sort of configured in so many different ways mm. and ideas of like, are they people, but just magic? Right. Um, are elves troll because it's just magic like it's magic adjacent and so much that um you have that but i mean even zombies change i mean there's so much they're thinking about or the undeath in general of 
you know, very different, like slow, you know, slow George Romero sort of zombies as opposed to fast zombies that you see today of like just this undead wave sprinting at you. Uh, or even The Walking Dead being like, monsters, like there are monsters there, but of you know, you have the cliche then of like, but are people the real uh -huh. no. monsters all along? It's like, well, no monsters are monsters, but right. we are also dicks. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they they do change in every sort of conceivable way to the point of not, I mean, there was the rewrite of Beowulf as Grant, like the Beowulf oh, yeah, from yeah, Grendel's Grindle, perspective. Yeah. Um, That's like 50 years old now. Yeah. yeah. Um, I can't remember who wrote that, but, you know, there's, as time changed, we reevaluate Frankenstein's always been sort of, yeah. I mean, I actually don't know at the time if he's that ambiguous. So he's still kind of like a monster that, murders and maybe rapes women and wants to like propagate more of himself but yeah. then there's all the weird it's like very tragic about it yeah um, but then that gets yeah i think our it's it's weird how to me and maybe you have a comment about this monsters seem to kind of go in a sort of a cycle they're up and then they're down my yeah. friend's son was a pretty big monster movie generator in like the 30s 40s 50s like tailing way off into the 60s, 70s. Right. Now we're in a big vampire and zombie wave, right? Like it's weird. Like these things just seem to yeah. do this a lot. Um, yeah. Like, I mean, when that's... is Frankenstein coming back? <laughs> Frankenstein's, hmm. I mean, Frankenstein is sort of like immortal in a lot of ways at this point. It's like ubiquitous. Um, I think it, it really depends on what, like another way to think about it. So monsters are like an embodiment of cultural fears. So there, we either generate new monsters in response to that in some ways. Um, contemporary, um, I'm trying to think, but you have like, so something like vampires, this very individualistic figure, let's say, where you can think about it in ways of like disease or, you know, sexuality and seduction. So they're, like way like there are things that vampires let's say seem sort of attached to in a lot of different ways as opposed mm -hmm. to a zombie like vampires in a lot of ways we would think of them as intellectual or very generally um or at least capable of speaking a lot of times as opposed to a zombie which is this completely mindless or, thing yeah. right that shambles or runs and walks but it doesn't have a central will so there's different you know, dragons even is this huge, gigantic, monolithic engines of destruction or like rain of fire. Yeah, like rain yeah. of fire or um Well then there's then another thing about today is is so often we see this rationalization that they're from another planet, right? It's aliens, yeah. right? They become everything becomes an alien. Fairies are aliens, vampires are aliens, dragons are aliens. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like right. like this. And that's where we get into so dealing with like literary monsters versus something like aliens, which is we're in like a paranormal almost mm. realm now of like something like the X Files, where I mean there are people who strongly believe in extra extraterrestrial life or things like this, and that's different in a lot. Like lived belief is different than me talking about um, Fafnia. Sure. So the thing about yeah. that is a monster yeah. where I don't, it's I don't know many people who's, I mean, well, he's killed in the story, but even then it's hard to justify. It's like, well, Fafnir is still around <laughs> eating people. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I see what you mean. It's different literarily versus like cryptozoologically. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Have you read Ligoti? Yeah, I have read uh, Thomas Ligoti. He was part of the, like what maybe we'd call a tradition of new weird. So weird literature in general is sort of separated into two. You get the old weird or the hot weird, I think is what Trina Weavell terms it. And then more recently, from the 80s-ish on, this like recapitulation of weird horror, weird fiction that they've termed the new weird because it's less, I mean, it's still horror, cosmic horror in a way, but it's dealt with as like a postmodern almost version of it. Ligotti's good. Um, I like Ligotti. I like um, Jeff and Anne Vandermeer um, do a lot of interest like the Annihilation of the Southern Reach Trilogy is what I think it's called. Um, but they also do some great anthologies. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in The Weird 2, there's a really fantastic anthology by 
edited by Jeff and Ann Vandermeer called The Weird. That's just a collection of chunks of short stories and novel, or short stories and chunks of novels from around the world. Okay, like that'll cool. have to be another one of those titles you give me. Yeah. Years. Okay, cool. You know, uh, did I tell you my last semester of undergrad, I actually took a class on vampires? No, I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I needed one more credit so I could take any class I wanted. I just needed a credit. So I, I had always made fun of kind of, you know, not, not brutally, but I'd always kind of like laugh a little bit with some friends yeah. about the vampire class that was on the books. And I thought, uh, you know what, I'm just, I'm gonna take it. Just right, to, like, see, let's see what this is about. Yeah, and it was, it was really interesting. I mean, we started with Eastern European folklore way back, and then, yeah. you know, we go all, it's a while before we get to Bram Stoker, and then reading some of the 20th century, and, but, and this was actually pre-Twilight. Yeah, <laughs> so, so you're probably like with like Anne Rice yeah, sort of ending we, point then. Well, and, and then some, some later like short stories, you know, I couldn't right. remember the authors of any of that. Yeah. But no, I, so I've got, I have a surprising, Let's say in vampire <laughs> from, literature. From vampire, trolls and vampires. Yes. That's, that's right. That's going to be the title of my autobiography. <laughs> uh, Simon asks, do you think Nibbling has a connection to Nibbleheim that it originally applied to dwarves or some other mythical beings? Thoughts? Um, I I really wouldn't be able to give a good answer for that. Um, Historical etymology is not my field of, of study or expertise by any chance, uh, I, you you probably have a better... I think, I mean, nibble nibble isn't an impossible etymology, no. etymological connection. There's there's a root for uh, cloud. It's actually the same as in nebula, right? Right, yeah. So it's like foggy, misty. So yeah, there could be, it could be connected. That It could be from the same root. That doesn't necessarily mean they have to be connected, right? Yeah. I, I don't think there's much reason to think of the Nibelungs as, well, okay, I'm, I'm saying from the north side of the story, you may have a different position, German side of the story, but I don't see much reason to, to think of Sigurd or Gunnar or anybody else in the story other than Reagan as like potentially a dwarf or elf. Like I think they are they are superhuman rather yeah. than parahuman. Um, Would you disagree with that characterization? There's um, Hagen is kind of weird. Hagen's a little weird, but there's in his description of Siegfried, he is you get you, a dragon. There's mention of like the, his cloak and visibility he gets from a dwarf as well. But again, this is all like off screen essentially. Like that's yeah. the weird thing is like a lot of this supernatural stuff in the Nibelung and Lead is like it's contained to this description of Sieg, of uh, Siegfried, and then Siegfried just has like his cloak of like. Cloak of Invisibility that he uses to help um, Gunther his trials in wooing right. Bunhild, the Queen of Iceland, because she's going to kill them all. <laughs> it's just, and then the, the uh, Nibelungans is just where Siegfried goes, and he single-handedly conquers them, so he can come back and conquer Iceland, so she doesn't like right. decide I'm still going to kill you even though you've passed these trials. But then in Old Norse, Nibelunger is the son of Hogni. Yeah. So yeah. I don't even know how this name got. Um, like Hogni, and the, the Hogni and Hagen are extremely, like Hagen is just like the king's, like right, like he is just trying to maintain this, this lineage, like his lineage, he's trying to do the proper knightly thing. But he's not his brother. His lord, not his yeah. brother. Um, and he's like a bad guy, but then in Norse, he's his brother, and he's like the most reasonable, loyal brother. Yeah. That's, yeah. Um, so that, like there's uh, the probably different figures that are, like similar names, but like change, like, okay, Hogni, but he's actually gonna be this person, we're just gonna call him Hagen or whatever, right? Well, there's some, I think that there's a reasonable position that actually the German tradition is closer to the original, as much as there's ever originals. Yeah. Because um, uh, all of Gunnar's family have alliterating names, except him, right? So you got yeah. Kyuki, Grimhild, Gunnar, Gudrun, Gutorn, but then Hogni. Yeah. So it is possible that originally he's not part of that family. Just just that suggests that he may not be. Yeah. Right. And I think the earliest manuscripts of what we consider like a complete version of Volsung Saga and uh, the Nibelung and Lied are roughly contemporaneous. They're not like one's not significantly older than the other. No. So twelve hundred. Like these, like it's, it's like the idea of like cultural variations of the story. I think is pretty prominent in. Both is especially from, let's say, the Scandinavian perspective of this like 
the Fornaldo saga looked like this honor-based society, right? Because the tragedy there is it's Butram killing Sigurd in his sleep after having sworn blood brothership. Well, no, the bro he's the younger brother who didn't swear. Oh, that's right. That's why that's they got right. him to do it, because he's that's the one who, who was But they still, young. what do they feed him, uh, like, sheep's blood? No, it's like wolves' hearts and snakes and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. so he wouldn't be too scared but, to go and do it. <laughs> but that's a big Norse motif, which is yeah. getting the thing that was too young to swear an oath to actually break the oath. Because right. Baldur, too. mistletoe yeah. Yeah. Um, for it, where, yeah, Hagen is just, you know, a king's man through and through. You were asked about Zelazny. I have thoughts on Zelazny. You read Roger Zelazny? I have not. No, I'm just not familiar with Zelazny. Do you, what are your thoughts on Zelazny? Okay, so I don't actually read a lot of fantasy and sci-fi, but I like uh, a lot of Roger Zelazny's work. Um, I am a particularly big fan of A Rose for Ecclesiastes, which is his story about a linguist on Mars. This is back, <laughs> this is written in like the last five years. You could actually have a story about intelligent life on Mars. Mars right. But he, uh, I don't I don't know. I guess there was that movie in the last 10 years about- Arrival? Arrival, yeah, yeah. about a linguist too. But this, but he's actually like a historical linguist on Mars. Uh, so- <laughs> just like there. Like, yeah, but, but he's, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a good story. Um, and uh, it's a little bit of a downer. Uh, I don't. I don't know if I could name a weird, like a classical weird fiction story. I'd be like, oh, how uplifting! Right, <laughs> it's <yes>. never like <laughs> Lovecraft's. Um, it's his abulient death or insane. Yeah, this super purple prose. It's just like either go insane, or die, or die, or both, or. Well, that's like Seems playing the universe or revealed and that's like playing call the Cthulhu anyway i mean yeah you go yeah, insane oh, yeah, and you die like, <laughs> <laughs> just roll for insanity it's like oh well you die this is your third character this session real good sh real good run here chest <laughs> we're losing people's respect by bringing up the rpg <laughs> um how do you say if nuclei mccluhan cthulhu <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and old high german oh i i think it's just that like i think it's um the um, this different language you have to reproduce those so because that was the thing in the stories like that's found that particular phrase is found in different cultures all over so phonetically that's that's how you would say it in old high german okay the same it's my, my cop out yeah. okay great cop out <laughs> in the yeah that which is dead can eternal lie but with strange aeons even death may die right, right. Yeah. Really showing. I'm bringing under. Like, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for that translation request from uh, from it's somebody. It's old. You'd have to come up with different. It's it have to be an alien script. Like, a, can that be rendered? And I'm gonna say. I'm just gonna go ahead and say no to, to foreclose the possibility. <laughs> uh, more questions, comments from the audience. We probably can't go much beyond an hour today. Uh, given some physical limitations we've got here, um, I do I do really appreciate your time. Yeah, no, super happy to to be here. Even the left half of Taylor was more interesting than most cool people. That's kind. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to be, you know, socially distant or whatever here. Uh, how did how did I do in my qualifier? Well. Um, <laughs> Yes, HK, you suck and we hate you, right? Um, <laughs> so actually there were few enough people shooting in the qualifier or classifier is what it really was, um, that I was able to shoot uh, two guns of two different divisions. Oh. Yeah, so I shot uh, my USP Elite 9 mil and Limited Minor and my HK-45 and Limited 10 Major. And uh, I continue, you know, nobody believes that it ought to be true but i just shoot the 45 better i you know i'm yeah. i'm a i'm a d or maybe a low c in the nine mil and i'm a c or maybe a low b in the 45 so yeah i got some great particular shots i'm not going to bore people with but I, <laughs> I i had a fantastic draw and two in the same hole from 10 yards that was pretty cool excellent yeah good work thank you uh can I ask what your Twitter handle is? Are you? I'm on. Are you yeah. officially? I on am Twitter? officially on Twitter. Yeah. Not, yeah. Um, not my my long forgotten. I hate Jackson. Crawford I hate account. Jackson Crawford account. Though. Yeah. What is the? I would just quote tweet you. Yeah. Just like, just like. 
Oh God. Um, what is what is the handle of that one? Is it I hate I, Jackson Crawford? No, it's it's um, <laughs> Norse Alpha four twenty sixty nine. I wanted it to be incredibly something like that. It had to be deeply obvious that it wasn't um, serious in any way. And then I got incredibly busy with other work. That there are people who would take that seriously. A parody Twitter account wasn't my real one. Norse Alpha, which I never, um, never really use, but happy to answer questions on. We could also have you. I'm trying to think of some way you can guest post on Patreon, but I don't think you can. Uh, it's just at Taylor underscore Booty. And that's B U D D E. B U D D E, yes. Wonders of having that particular pronunciation. <laughs> of, yeah. You get a lot of, you get uh, Mr. Bud. Oh, will you favor us buddy? with a moment of your Anatoly Lieberman? <laughs> oh, man. So, Anatoly Lieberman, professor at the University of Minnesota, a great man. Truly great. great yeah, man. no, absolutely. Um, but he has such a wonderful, unique way of speaking and, and, and being. Yes. Uh, Professor Lieberman was the one who taught Old Norse mythology and German fairy tales. And I just, I, I, this is the way he introduced the first day of class every time is he's, imagine your very stereotypical professor tweed jacket, elbow patches, a handkerchief. When he walks in, good evening students. My name is Professor Anatoly Lieberman and I have the great joy of being your professor this fine semester. First thing I will ask of you though is to please do not ask me where I come from. Uh, do not ask me what my accent is because I simply have no accent. I speak perfect BBC radio English and have frankly been speaking English longer than most of you have been alive. And he would lament things like he was this again wonderful person. Do you read Dickens? Yes. Do you read? <laughs> we talk about this rather Dickensian moment in Blade's film where Thor must don a wedding dress. Um, and it's, of course, you are, are familiar with Dickens, or are you not? Do you, do you read still? Um, he would lament things. Ah, I lament the state of current historical linguistics or spelling reform. He's very big on spelling reform. <laughs> but why do we spell things this way? Even I cannot say. It's simply, it's nonsense. I would always wind up on panels with him. And <laughs> this is, is such a dead on impression. I remember we were on a panel together once and uh, we were like, you know, there was like five people in the audience, right? It's like a historical <laughs> linguistics <laughs> panel <laughs> at SAS. And he said, we should, we, because our topics somewhat overlap, we ought to have called it historical linguistics and sex. sex. And sex would have brought them you know, something like that. Um, you can <laughs> look up, there's a few things for he just, YouTube search Anatoly Lieberman. There's some great videos of him. If you can still find it, he did a video on the etymology of the word twerk with Minnesota Public Radio once. Yes. It was the funniest thing. Hearing this man go, twerk! <laughs> to vigorously shake one's buttocks in a provocative <laughs> manner is this poor dude from St. Petersburg. It's just, he's awesome, though. He is, uh, he is, a, he is a great scholar, and he's not a stereotype of a professor. He's an archetype. No, like he is the er, yeah. <laughs> er professorship. Is like he's haunted. awesome. Very kind man. Great man. Any uh, voices of the past YouTube channel? I don't know. Um, I don't, I've never never seen it. Read English translations of old manuscripts, including old notes. I'm not familiar with them. Yeah, I'm familiar personally. Oh, yeah, and Stella found the twerk. Oh, yeah, yeah that's the... <laughs> yeah, he has, he has opinions on other things. I don't... I, I guess I'm, I'm afraid of scandalizing his reputation by mentioning other words he's etymologized that are of a similar character. Because So he's also the author of a book I refer people to often, which is um, his recent collection. Well, it's actually, it's a collection of most of his essays from like decades in yeah. prayer and laughter. Yeah. Oh, great, great stuff. That's where he, he goes into the origins of Futhark. Yeah, he does have opinions on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he thinks, <laughs> yeah, right. That's actually that's actually surprisingly in line with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, that's worth it. Maybe don't. I don't know if we spoil it. That I won't spoil his, it. His 
I don't think I did in my video about the order. I can bet that's a bonus thing of me trying to read that paragraph as Anatoly Lieberman. In the movie, yeah, so. he has an extremely interesting <laughs> perspective on the <laughs> origin little, of the of the order of the Elder Fruit. Yes, my a little vulgar, even a little vulgar, <laughs> surprisingly <laughs> vulgar. Yeah, uh, it's possible, uh, but no, I won't spoil it for anybody. Great. In prayer and laughter. In prayer and laughter. Do you have concluding thoughts for us, concluding recommendations? A top three titles you've mentioned that you would tell people to follow up with? Um, Check out the Side of the Volsungs and the Nibbling in the primary sources, of course. Yes. Um, and then, so if you're looking for, let's say, something like short story along the lines of Lovecraft, uh, I think Gustav Mayrink has a lot that's similar to, not, not I'll, Preface by saying all of it's like cosmic. You're not ending up with Cthulhu, mm -hmm. but there's a very similar horror atmosphere. In um, there's like I said, there's a collection called The Opal and Other Stories, translated by I can't remember. It's State Dallas Press though, that I think is pretty serviceable. I would also recommend uh, the anthology The Weird by uh, Anne and Jeff Vandermeer, that was. Or edited by them that's a world it, like it's a huge span of weird fiction from all of the worlds with some new translations by stuff and then um something that is out that i think is often lumped in as let's say canonical weird fiction from a german author's the other side by um alfred kubin okay. who's primarily known as an expressionist painter and uh artist but this was one novel and it's I'd say extremely readable. Um, there's a couple of good translations out there. I don't think um, probably the highest rated ones on Amazon would be great, but I enjoy that one uh, a lot. Okay. Well, thank you very much, David. Thanks for joining us. Thanks yeah. for answering some questions. Thank, thank you for having me. Any uh, final thoughts, insults, or blessings? To you or to the audience? I mean, blessings, <laughs> obviously, to the audience, to you. Uh, I guess thank you for paying some of the coffee. Oh yeah, for having yeah, yeah, me yeah. fetch it for you. Yes, as, as you, were, you were very kind to always bring me coffee <laughs> at those nine a.m. classes. Uh, uh, not which, entirely. You didn't request it. I didn't request it, but you but you did bring it. And I do appreciate yeah. that. Even though nine a.m. to me is like one p.m. for other people. <laughs> yeah, well, by that point you still need it again, right? Like right, you've had like, you've had the morning coffee. Now it's early afternoon. Right. Exactly. From my ac academic caffeine consumption is something else for a lot of us. Man, when I when I left UCLA and I went to work at the museum in Wyoming, I was drinking a pot of coffee in the morning and a pot of coffee in the afternoon. I was I was crazy. But anyway, that's, <laughs> that's highly that's, believable. That's long gone now. Well, yeah, thank you everyone for having me and thank you for the great questions. Um thanks for your patience. You Oops, sorry. I was saying I'll give you the yeah. list of some stuff to read. Okay, and thanks for your Patreon support. And uh, we are getting some of the Crowdcast rolling again, so we'll have some more guests uh, before long. And uh, I'll put this up on YouTube for you to watch uh, later too. All right. Well, folks from uh, the Antelope Room, <laughs> all the best. <laughs>